Are you all ready? Okay, so Danielle is a former tennis standout at Michigan, also most recently the head women's coach at Yale University, and among many other accomplishments, has also just launched her own company, Danielle Lund Coaching. So I'd love to welcome you up, and thank you so much for being here. Shauna and thanks to USTA New England for putting on this great event. Thanks to all of you for coming and we have a fantastic panel of college coaches here with over dec decades of college coaching and recruiting experience and they're going to share as much knowledge as they can with you tonight, um, answer questions. So the plan is I'm going to moderate this panel. We're going to cover as many topics as we can about the college, how to navigate the college tennis recruiting process. And we are gonna save about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for Q&A and open it up. So if you have questions, definitely feel free to ask those at the end. But before we get started, I'm gonna have our fabulous coaches introduce themselves, tell us where they're currently coaching, a little bit about them, and maybe any other previous institutions that you guys um, have experience coaching at would be great, so. Hi all, uh, congratulations on being here. It's a great event. Uh, my name is Paul Gassengay. I'm the head coach at Bates College. I coach both the men and women's team. Uh, starting my 27th year. Uh, so school up in Maine and part of the NESCAP. Uh, coach against uh, Todd and Jackie. So It's a tough act to follow with uh, Paul. Uh, I'm the Amherst men's coach. I've been here nine years, I think. Um, and 26 year overall coaching. Hi everyone, I'm JC Nunez. I'm the head coach of the women's team at UMass. I've been the head coach for six years now. Before that, I was the assistant coach at Brown for two years. And before that, I was at UMass as the assistant coach for six years. Hi, welcome everybody. This is a great honor to be here to speak with you guys. I am Jackie Bagwell. I've been at Amherst College for 33 years, I believe. Um, before that, I was at Hamilton College for three years. I can hardly remember that, but I was there. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm probably going to stay at Amherst at this point. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so as you can see, we have coaches from many divisions here, and before I get into conversation with them, I just want to quickly give you an overview of the landscape of college tennis in case you're not aware. So college tennis, we have five divisions, division one, two, three, NAIA, and junior college. Division one, two, and, one, two, and three are sponsored by the NCAA. NAIA and junior colleges are, are in their kind of their own, they have their own set of rules, their own championships. But there are over 1,700 college tennis teams out there covering all five divisions. So there are options for, for everyone here, lots of different levels. Um, so, you know, really keep a, your, your, your mind open and, and lots of options open to you, especially early on. So we're gonna kind of go through this chronologically. Um, starting with the beginning of the process for all of you and recognizing that different divisions have different recruiting rules um, as far as like the timing that they're allowed to speak with you and all of that. But um, if you guys could just talk about how does the process begin from your end? What do you do? How do you start communicating with coaches? How do you make your lists and when does that happen? All right, I'll, um, I can get us started. Um, I think I'm the only Division One coach here, so I know the rules a little bit uh, different, and the rules have also changed a lot over the last uh, few years, as, the, as Danielle was mentioning. But um, for me in Division One, some of the big differences is that we offer at least scholarships as opposed to uh, Division Three schools. For us, the process does start fairly early. I would say by the time you finish your sophomore year, you know, is when you can start, uh, you know, sending emails out to coaches and being in that communication now. Um, and the best piece of advice that I can always give, and kind of alludes to what Danielle was mentioning in the beginning, is when you start the, this process to really start broad. Like, don't, don't constrain yourself too much in the beginning. I would say look at very different kind of universities in different areas, different divisions, and really try to, 
get as much information, get as much knowledge as possible. And like I said, I think the first step is, you know, identifying those schools that you feel, you know, might have the things that you're looking for, and then sending out emails to the coaches. And just, I think the best thing you can do at the beginning is just a brief introduction. I don't think you want to overload with too much information. It's a little bit about who you are, where you're from, you know, what your goals are. If you have a, if you have like a video maybe of your game that you can share with the coaches, what your tournament schedule looks like, you know, for that, that coming year so they have an idea of where you're gonna be. I think that's always the, the best thing you can do to, uh, to get the process started and get that communication going with the coaches. Yeah, maybe the um, one thing that's a little different about Division Three is that um, we have a lot less rules, in a sense, um, where Division One is very structured, they have a strict calendar. Um, in Division Three, you, there's sometimes um, maybe freshmen uh, reach out to us um, and just say, hey, you know, I played a tournament at Amherst, they'd really be interested, I'm studying hard, just wanted to um, get on your radar. So it really, it depends, um, but like Coach said, it's, it's really important to like look at a lot of schools, do a lot of research, and see what might fit. Uh, what you're looking for, like academically, tennis, and location-wise. The other thing I would add is don't be afraid to reach out. You know, we all have recruiting databases and tennis recruiting and UTR, and we're looking at that stuff. But it's hard to know everyone, and you can, you know, reach out to the coach first and express an interest because that'll differentiate you from the thousands of other athletes who we're looking at and recruiting. And it's about forming that relationship uh, even early on. So don't be afraid to reach out to the coach, like was said earlier. Great. Um, okay, so for you all, when do, when do you begin reaching out to recruits? And I don't know, like Division One, JC, yesterday was a huge day for you. So for rising juniors, June 15th, between your sophomore and junior year is the first date that a Division I college coach can have recruiting communication with you. Prior to that, they can send you questionnaires, they can send you camp information, they can send you institutional uh, materials that are, that are published through their admissions office, but that's about it. And for Division Three, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's actually much earlier, like for, as freshman year, is that correct? In high school, that, not that you're probably doing that, but you can. So when do you all begin really reaching out and also the lists? I know I get a lot of questions about like, what are coaches looking at? Do they look at UTR, WTN, tennis recruiting? Like, how do I get on their list? Can you guys talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I, I, I believe we start building our list pretty early. Um, I get um, emails from first years in high school that um, it's amazing. Some of them like I want to. I want to major in STEM. I want to be very academic. Um, so we start hearing from people very early. I have a database, um, and we use a recruiting software at Amherst uh, called Arms, and I collect all the names. And, and then when I I can email like a bulk email, and I reach out to all different classes. Some some of my emails are geared towards. Um, younger kids and then some of them are geared towards um, people that are juniors or seniors. I just reached out to a bunch of juniors um, telling them about the early read process. So it's always good to kind of get your name out there because every time I hear from every single tennis player, I put them in a database and then they start receiving information. Um, yeah, like Daniel mentioned, uh, in Division One yesterday was a big day, and I got a few uh, few emails uh, yesterday. And yeah, really, this time right now during the summer is when we start we start that process of starting to look at the players for for that year, those rising juniors. Um, for me, it's very important to you know get to know the person, start to build a relationship with them, with their parents, with their coaches, which does take time. You know, every coach is different and has a, a different philosophy, but yeah, I mean, I do like to kind of get that process started early on to really start to get to know you, you get to know me, my assistant coach, our program, so we can start our relationship, because ultimately, 
you know, I think the most important thing is for you to find the, the best fit and the place that, are, that you're going to thrive. And I think a lot of it comes out to the people, you know, and if you can find a good place with good people, good coaches, good teammates, a good department that has the things that you're looking for, that's what's going to set you up for success. And, but yeah, nowadays the process starts earlier and earlier. In, in Division 1 it used to be later, now it's moved to this date of June 15th. Um, so like I said, I think the earlier you can start getting your name out there with coaches, establishments, that's going to you know, set you up for success in the long term. Um, and also, many, if, if not all, of these programs around the country have online recruiting questionnaires on their website. And I, oftentimes when you can go on their website and you fill that questionnaire out, it will just kind of enter your information into their database so that they'll know who you are in addition to being able to email them. So that's just another, another avenue for you to get in touch with coaches. Um, okay, so we started the process. You've reached out or they've reached out. Maybe you've had a few emails. You're kind of getting to know each other and now we're getting on the phone. That seems like probably the next natural step is a phone call. Talk about that. Like, what are you looking to get out of that phone call? Um, what are some questions that maybe for the recruits and their parents should be thinking and asking you? As Like you said, JC, I think this is a long process. It's all about finding the right fit, building relationships. So the, phone, the conversations over the phone are really important. Um, or maybe Zoom. Nowadays, I know coaches are using Zoom a lot. Can you talk about how you approach that part of the recruiting process? The phone calls are, are always fun. I think um, people are less uh, comfortable talking on the phone these days and they prefer texting sometimes, but I think it's important. You're gonna have that type of relationship with your coach and you're gonna have face-to-face -face conversations. So it's really important to start that in the recruiting process. Um, one of the things I would uh, note is that you wanna have some questions uh, prepared for the call but know you're gonna have many conversations throughout the process and you don't have to necessarily ask every single question in the first phone call. And also to, I would say, listen to the conversation because a lot of times I'll have conversations with athletes who, uh, I've already answered that question and, and what I've just said and, and they'll just go down their list and say, well, what about this? And I, I thought I just answered that, but it's just, Make it more of a conversation instead of just like a formula of I gotta ask all these questions. Just get to know the coach. Uh, definitely ask the questions, but you know, make it a give and take. Yeah, I think what Coach Paul said is really important is that um, the give and take part is uh, we're getting to know you, but you also wanna get to know the coach that you might be looking to play for, um, whether it's Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time with your coach and the assistant coach and and the team. So um, yeah, it's probably nerve-wracking maybe the first call, um, but it's also a great experience. And and nowadays, like let's say you forget your two most important questions because you're having a great conversation. All you have to do is just text or email the coach and say, hey, thank you so much for taking the time. It was a really great conversation, but I forgot these two questions. And um, so. Really just try to have fun with the process. I think the most asked questions are what what is your season like? When does it begin? When does it end? How many matches do you play? Um, what about my academics? Am I going to miss classes for tennis practice? Um, what comes first, tennis or academics? I think um, people want to know, like, is there a strength coach? Um, is there um, academic support? Those are good questions. Um, what if what if I'm injured? What kind of support is there for me? Um, is it possible for me to go abroad? Is that something that I that that I would be able to do and play in your program? So I think a lot of questions like that, like, how many hours a day do you practice? Um, how many how many hours a day are you with the strength coach? How many hours will I have to study? Will I be able to major? Will I be able to be a pre-med pre major? Will I be able to play? Um, will I be able to graduate in four years? I think those are a lot of questions that we get asked lots of times. And I also feel that an, a good question, I think, to always ask the coach is, 
to ask the coach to tell you know tell him or her about what their coaching style is like, what their coaching philosophy is like, what are their values, what are their goals as a team, but also to help each individual player. Because again, there's so many different coaches and we all have, you know, we're all different and we all have different personalities and we all have different backgrounds and different attitudes. And I think, um, you know, not every coach is for everybody. And I think it's important for you to find as well the coach is gonna align with with your personality and your values and your goals. So I think that's also an important question to ask. And and I think as well, you know, some questions that I that I like to ask that I think would be, you know, it's good to be prepared for. It's also I like to always ask, you know, the individual to tell me like, okay, what are your goals? Like what what do you want to get out of this experience in college tennis? Um, I also like to ask because obviously all of you who are here you know, to get to this level, to play at this tournament, obviously you've put a lot of hours into your tennis, into your training, like you, you, you make a lot of sacrifices, a lot of commitment. And I also like to ask, like, why do you do this? Like, why do you, why do you play tennis? Why do you love tennis? Like, why do you want to be a college tennis player? Because I also feel that, you know, it's very important to know your why, you know, behind what you do. And that's something that I always like to, to ask in those conversations. No, that's great, well said. Um, another question that I encourage recruits to ask if the coach doesn't bring it up is what's the next step for me in the process? Because I think it's important to keep the process moving. It's so easy to end a call or an in-person conversation and be like, that was great. Wow, I had such a great call and not know at all what's next. Like, do they want me to send something? Do they need academic information? You know, what, how, what is the next thing for me? Are we setting up another call? Like, <laughs> what do I do? Um, so just, it, it's a fair question to ask, and I think that the coach will give you an honest answer of what that is, but that's a really good thing just to keep in mind. Um, okay, so we're moving along, building the relationship, and you guys are gonna hit the road soon and travel to a bunch of tournaments this summer, really busy recruiting period for you. Um, when you go and watch players play in person, what are you looking for? What are you watching and what are you looking for? What matters to you? Um, what are your thoughts? One of the best pieces of advice I was given, it was after college when I was playing professionally, was don't worry about your ranking. Don't worry about your uh, rating because you can want that, but you that's not how you get there. It's all about the process. So the reason I say that is I think Sometimes in the summer, uh, you're all playing in front of a bunch of coaches at a, a showcase or at a tournament, you know, you're being watched and you, you end up playing not to lose. And that's not what the coaches want to see. The coaches want to see you fight your hardest, have a great attitude, hustle for every ball, be the best version of yourself. Whether that means you win or lose that day, we're not looking at the win and the loss because we know that's part of the journey you're going to have a lot of losses and you're going to have some great wins but we want to see you know how do you deal with those adversities in the match how do you perform because college tennis is it's all about fighting through those adversities and and finding a way to compete for your teammates so you might win you might lose but how are you being on court during that process For me, I would say one thing that's very important is seeing how you compete. Um, you know, your attitude on the court, um, how you handle adversity when you're down, let's say you lose the, the first set, how you come back to the second set, let's say you're down second set, how you keep fighting. You know, those are things that are very important for me because um, I feel like if you, if you have a consistent, you know, attitude and you show up consistently, then I think in the long term, you know, you're always gonna improve and get better. Um, so for me, that's something that's very important. And also, you know, college tennis is a team sport, you know, and I think also, you know, that can also correlate to how you're gonna be as a team and how you're gonna be in practice, you know, competing with your teammates, because, you know, the goal when you're in practice on a college team, you know, I think there's two goals, right? You're working on your game and you wanna improve and grow, but you also have to understand that you also have a responsibility to also help your teammates, you know, improve and grow. So together, as a team, we can get better and how you compete, you know, how you show up on the court, you know, something that, you know, really relates to that and it's something that, 
you know, it's very important for me when I go to these events. I always look for players, um, I always tell a team, you're either green and growing or you're ripe and rotting. Some players have played as, as much tennis as they, as they can as juniors and by the time they get to college, they're a little over it. I'm looking for people that when they get to college, they still love the sport. They're gonna love to come to practice every day. That's very, very important to me. Um, I have to say, one of the things that impressed me most, um, a kid that's on my team now, when I went to watch her at a showcase, she told me, I went and found this person I've never played doubles with before. I found her, I met with her, I asked her a bunch of questions, I bonded with her, and then when we went on the court, we played really well. And I said, this is a person I went on my team. I want somebody that's going to want to consult with their teammates, really make bonds with them. Because at the, at the end of four years, like, coaches are important, but your team are, are the people that you're going to be bonded with the rest of your life. You're going to go to their weddings, you're going to um, keep in touch with them, and I think that's like the most important thing is your teammates. So I'm really looking for somebody, or I think coaches are looking for somebody that really wants to be part of the team, really wants to get better. Just to add one last thing, um, it's not always the easy matches to play, but um, I think generally speaking, the backdraw matches, um, I know sometimes you want to get home, I know sometimes it's tough to play after a loss. Um, those, I, I don't know, I, I think they're really, really important, and I think how much fight you show and how you compete um, says a lot about your character and how you are, like in a college match, you might lose doubles and you feel like you let yourself down, your team, your doubles partner down, and your team down, uh, but then you still need five minutes later, you need to go out there and play singles. So um, the backdraw matches are where, um, back when I was in Division I um, at Kalamazoo, um, where we found, um, we were interested in the guy, but how he played in the backdraw, um, we ended up recruiting him, offering him a big scholarship, and he went on to make the quarters of Division I singles NCAA tournament. So, um, and that was, you know, it just, just, it's really important. And also, I think a lot of coaches check, you know, we're constantly looking online at results, UTR, um, tennis recruiting, USTA, that world tennis number. But when you look and you see backdraw and you see withdraw, 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 um, sometimes that's, I know this probably isn't like what you want to hear. Um, and there are times you need to get home. You have a big, big exam or you have a family trip. Um, but when you start seeing that a lot, I think that, speaks to maybe where you're at and, and um, that those matches are really important. Every match should should be fun and mean something to you and um, really go out in those matches and, and try to make the most of it because I, I think college coaches are, are looking and interested in how you play in those situations. Okay, when you go to tournaments, and obviously you're there to watch their matches and you know their strokes and their game and all that and how they compete, but does it end there? Do you watch, are you observing beyond the lines of the court? In other words, are you watching them interact with their friends and their parents? Are they carrying their bag or is mom and dad carrying their bags? Those kinds of things. Are you observing that as well? Absolutely. I've actually stopped recruiting athletes when I've seen them on, on the phone call and I know they're talking to their parents and they're doing it in a disres disrespectful way and you know, and it's super important. Um, like Todd said, character is really important and so we're kind of watching you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> on that note. switch gears and I would like to talk to you because we have a lot of parents in the room. I would like to get your thoughts. You've been doing this a long time, lots of experience in the recruiting process. What is the role of the parent in the recruiting process? I think the parent definitely has a role because they're funding this venture and uh, they want to make sure that you're gonna be happy and, and I think it's important that they're included and I always include the parent, parents in the family because it's gonna be a big extended family when you're on the team 
but I want the athlete to drive the process. I want the athlete to be communicating, not the parent. If someone has a question, that's totally fine, but I, I want to be hearing from the athlete themselves. Yeah, I think he kind of you know, nailed it there. I think, as, as he said, um, you know, parents definitely should be a part of the process, and same thing, I always make myself available if parents want to talk to me or set up a call or have any questions, but I do think ultimately, you know, you, the athlete, should be the one driving the process, should be the one, you know, having, you know, the majority of the communication, because ultimately, wherever you choose to go, you're the one who's going to be interacting, you know, with that coach um, on a daily basis. Um, so I think, um, I think it's just part of the, you know, of your growth process too as a, as a person. I think take the responsibility, you know, and lead that process. I don't mind speaking with parents at all. I mean, you know, as parents, you, you know your kids very well, but it's also important that the student athlete has, you know, a voice in what they want to major in and what school they want to go to. Um, <laughs> I have a daughter that just graduated from high school. She does not play tennis. I would have loved her to play tennis, but I've let her do her own thing and she's shy. So I think I've had kids on my team, their parents really wanted them to be pre-med. They just couldn't do it. And it's, yeah, it's good. It's good for parents to be involved, but it's also as a, as a, as a student athlete, you need to really use your voice and let your parents know um, what, you know what what you want to do what school you want to go to and what you what you want to major in okay let's talk for one second about social media um, lots of junior tennis players have social media accounts do you use that as one data point in the gathering of information do you or your assistant does someone follow the recruits that you're seriously interested in what do you think about their how they should be using that. Have you ever, has social media ever deterred you from recruiting someone? <laughs> um, it's probably, uh, speaking for myself and most coaches, it's probably a pro part of the process, right? Like we're always trying to look for more information, learn more about you, learn more about your family, the coaches you work with, um, the fellow players you train with, what's that look like? So. It, it's probably all part of the process. Um, there are stories out, there's great stories out there where social media really helped a coach make a decision and, and there's probably some stories out there that it maybe goes the other way and that that person, maybe a coach made the decision, that person's not the best fit for their program. But, um, you know, I think it's like anything with social media, with jobs, with your looking to go to college um, and play on a team, it's all, it's all part of the process now. But yes, my assistants uh, usually research that. Uh, yes, it is a part of the process, and and yes, speaking for for our team, if we if we start to feel serious about someone and they could be a you know someone we're gonna be look at seriously to join our team, then we will we will look at um, at the social media and, and yes, you know I can think of at least one example in the past with someone that you know after seeing some things there, I felt like okay maybe it's not the right fit for a program. So I mean I think nowadays um, you know it's a big part of life, and I think we all understand that. And I think you know you just have to you know be smart about what you post there. And I mean for me personally, one thing that I like if I if I'm really interested in someone and I you know check out their Instagram or whatever, and I see they have a lot of stuff posted about tennis, like, you know, training, practicing, comments. you know, that's something that, at least to me, shows me, okay, like, you know, they really love tennis, really serious about tennis, so, you know, it's just something that I've, you know, felt in the past. I don't personally look at people's social media, um, unless it comes up some way, but the kids on my team, believe me, they, as soon as somebody shows an interest, if I mention their name or they mention Amherst, the kids on my team are all over it. And if anyone has a question, I'll just walk to where you are, just raise your hand, you can have the mic and ask, ask the question. But any final thoughts that we didn't get to? I'll uh, just say one thing real quick, and I think all of us kind of hit on it, but it's maybe worth reiterating, is make it fun and have fun with the process. You all have put a lot of time into your tennis. You've worked really hard, you've worked hard in the classroom. 
And um, while it seems stressful, um, there's maybe bias and think Amherst is one of the best places out there, but in all seriousness, there there's so many great schools and so many great coaches, and generally speaking, it always works out in the end. So um, really try to have fun with the process and um, not, not be too stressed about it. You're already probably stressed enough about um, taking hard classes and getting the results you want on court, but I think really just try to enjoy it because you've worked really hard and it's just part of the next step. Great. All right, any questions? <laughs> yes, okay. First of all, thanks uh, for the panel. I really think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a privilege to have you up here. Uh, my question is, um, what, what, what are you the most proud of for your specific programs? Um, since you have a lot of athletes in here that are probably um, gonna, maybe going to your college. So what's the single most thing that you're most proud of with your programs? I think I'm most proud that I've been in Amherst for 33 years and I've never had to coach a kid I didn't like. For me, I would say the thing that I'm the most proud of and why I love what I do and I hope to do it for many more years is just the relationships and the connections that I've built. I've had the opportunity to meet some amazing people and to see some players that I've coached years ago and see what they're doing in their lives now or where they're at, it's, you know, that's something that makes me really proud. Um, very similar uh, would be being part of their journey and their process both on and off court and hopefully um, being a mentor in, in some shape or form with them and then when you see them come back uh, former players come back, whether it's just for they're in town and they're stopping by, whether it's a reunion weekend, alumni event, um, and just reconnecting with them and seeing where they're at and seeing how much the Amherst education and being part of the program um, really meant to them. It's hard to go last with this one because it's very similar, but I think the point I'd like to make is Everyone has some great successes and you've had some amazing victories over the years, but it, you don't really remember that so much. You remember, uh, like Todd said, the journey and, and the, the, the time in the van or you know the, the meetings you had with them to help them through a tough spot. And when you see them develop and you know later on have uh, families and careers of their own and you see them super successful and you are just a small part in helping them navigate through that part of their life. I mean, that's extremely rewarding. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see, any other questions? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. You guys have answered a lot of questions. As a parent, I really uh, kind of like it's very interesting to me. So I'm going to throw a tough question. So one of the things I'm trying really hard is find the balance between tennis and academic or tennis, between tennis and then just general activity for the kids. So uh, one of the seem like common trend is doing homeschool or home, online schooling for the high school and then so the kids can play more. From, uh, from you, you guys at college coach point of view, does that matter to you? And then uh, do you see a difference or any preference? I think we just want the student athletes to be well-rounded and well-adjusted and have the aptitude and have the work ethic to be able to succeed academically. Um, I think most coaches are not looking for a finished product. You know, we're looking for an athlete who's gonna continue to grow. At these top academic schools, you have to be able to handle the academics and so you've gotta have that proficiency and uh, so you have to challenge yourself in high school or else it's you're not going to get to that top academic school but whether it's through homeschooling or uh, prep school or public high school um, you know it's how, how you apply yourself and make it about the learning not the grade um, I had two regular before I was a college coach or actually it was the beginning of my college career I coached two uh, New England athletes 
uh, Camille Yanya and Elliot Poffin, right, who were both top 20 in the country, and they had regular high school experiences. You know, they literally went to high school, and they trained with me a couple days a week, and they went on to amazing careers. So, you can find the balance. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that I, you know, I really feel that there's, just, there's not one way to do it. Everybody has a different path and, and a different process. And I think ultimately, as long as you, as long as you have a good, you know, good goals and you understand, you know, where you want to get to and you have a good process to get there, then I think there's many ways to uh, be successful. And I mean, for schools here, you know, I think for all of us, we definitely value having a good balance, you know, and having a good experience. And like I said, I think if you come in with that mindset, I think you're going to be successful no matter where you go. I, I just want to add one quick thing to what they said, because um, I, so for 13 years I coached at Yale, and, the, and I, there is something to consider at those really, really top academic institutions. Homeschooling, not that you absolutely, there are people that go to top academic schools that did homeschooling and online schooling, no doubt about it, but I think that you are, admissions will scrutinize a little bit more the classes you've taken, the program you've, you've gone through, and I would strongly recommend adding, if you can, any element of in-person contact, whether you're taking a class at a local community college or, because you, when it comes to recommendations, I think having someone that has had interaction face to face with the, the applicant really matters. Um, so they can speak to how are you in a classroom setting? Because if you did online or homeschooling, you're gonna transition to college. You will be in the classroom, you will be expected to participate, meet rigorous deadlines and, and so on and so forth, and then add on to it the um, demands of being an athlete, missing class and so forth. So just, I think you really wanna be strategic with it. Um, and plan ahead and try to find that in-person component if, if you can, for sure. All right, uh, one, any other questions we have? Any topics? Yeah. Thank you all. Um, this has been a great night of um, questions and answers. I do have one um, question being from the New England area. Do you find yourself recruiting mostly from New England or outside of New England, given the kind of sport that tennis is? I'm sure we all here, different states have this type of rigorous outdoor program or year round. Coming from New England, how do your teams look in terms of reflecting kids that live in New England? Um, in the NESCAC, we have students from all over, but I have to say, um, it's been a while, but in 1999, we, um, Amherst won a, a national championship, the women's program, and we had players from New England, and I have to say that um, we had Neely Steinberg from Concord Tower, we had Pam Diamond from Trumbull, we had Caroline Castell from, I think, Old Line, um, and the fact that the kids were like a little bit more close to home, it became kind of like a, a huge energy thing with the parents coming and they really fed on it. So last year I, I, I decided to go back and I really prioritized um, getting a couple of kids from New England. We have uh, Maddie Squire and uh, Sophie Jopp. I always say her name wrong, but I have to say that the energy from the New England kids on a little, on a little bit more of a local team, that is, um, and, and, and the team did really well this year. And I think, like, the New England, the New England part of it, like, I, you know, I, um, I kind of embrace it. Yeah, I think, um, I think a lot of us become really familiar with everyone from New England because we see everyone more, um, which is a really, really good thing. Um, we had, uh, over a year ago, Harris Folks graduated. Um, he was unreal for the program, um, New England player. Um, we had Shaw Rylander graduate this year, um, previously Aaron Revson. Um, so there's been a lot of New England. I think that NESCAC in general 
um, while we end up recruiting all over and every year is a little bit different, but um, there's a lot of players from the East and Northeast in the conference for sure. Great. We have one more question. I think we have time for one more. Anyone? No? All right. Well, can we get a round of applause for our panelists? to all of you and I'm going to pass it back to Sean. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and thank you, all of our panelists.